Muito bom dia. Vamos dar então início. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to start the um, video, co the press conference after the uh, informal video conference meeting of EU education ministers. Yes, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We held the informal video conference meeting of EU education ministers today as part of the Portuguese presidency of the European Union. As you know, we were supposed to be meeting in Braga today. Obviously, it's a huge it's with huge regret that we weren't able to be in a physical conference in Braga today. But unfortunately, we had to have a video conference um, and we were separated behind our various um, screens. We talked about um, education, working towards the Porto Social Summit, which will take place on May the 7th, talking also about the implementation of the European Pillar of Social Rights. Obviously, we want to strengthen Europe through the European Pillar of Social Rights and strengthen the European Pillar of Social Rights through education and training. Let me just summarise the priorities of the Portuguese presidency. Obviously, edu educational inclusion is very important and everything linked to lifelong learning, vocational training, contribution to the European Pillar of Social Rights... As the Portuguese presidency has always said, we're talking about a greener, more digital, more resilient Europe, and we need to continue constructing something that we should have started building a longer time ago, which is the European education area and the European strategy for training and education within the European education area. It's very important that we contribute to this whole discussion and reflection process. And uh, the special advisor, Commissioner Schmidt's special advisor, was uh, present, uh, Dr. Vieira da Silva. He was uh, here and at the meeting and, was the keynote and gave the keynote speech. Uh, the Minister of uh, for Science, Technology and Higher Education now. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. As Minister Tiago Brandon Rodrigues has just said, the main aim of uh, the video conference meeting today was to listen to ministers from all of the member states and, of course, from the Commission for contributions that can feed into the social summit to be held in Porto in May. Talking about education, uh, post-secondary education, so tertiary education and how this links to science initiatives in particular. And we were able to build a consensus at a European level in three main areas, I would say. Social issues, European mobility, the Erasmus uh, framework. And there'll be a new programme, Erasmus Plus, which will be um, launched uh, towards the end of this six-month period in, um, in Portugal. Another important uh, aspect is ensuring, of course, that the Erasmus programme, which we're all proud of because it's a truly European uh, programme, but there is an inequality of access, so we need more equal access to Erasmus. There was a new programme, a new um, initiative launched in the last couple of years, which a lot of member states referred to today the university uh, networks, the European university networks. Um, that's a real way of, boast, of boosting social inclusion. Another aspect is the social dimension of the skills agenda, updating skills, uh, converting skills, um, reskilling and upskilling, to use the English terms there which, of course, is linked to the green and digital transition and the need 
to understand the impact of the crisis related to the pandemic that we're going through now and how this all links to a more resilient and building a more resilient uh, Europe, building skills to improve employability. And obviously tertiary education is very important uh, in that uh, context. It's of critical importance indeed because we do know how important new skills are for the digital and the green transition. The third thing that I wanted to talk about is the social dimension of learning, education and knowledge. And what we've done in Portugal to promote our scientific culture over the last uh, uh, 20 years, that I think was one of the things that has really become a reference point across the whole of Europe how we can open up the social dimension of access to knowledge. So I think that these three aspects, these three dimensions, were what we discussed uh, amongst the ministers and where there was a consensus amongst the ministers and with the uh, commissioners as well, the Commissioner Maria Gabriel in particular, the link between the European research area and this uh, European education area that we're building now. To Commissioner Maria Gabriel, please. Thank you very much, dear ministers, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the Portuguese presidency for organizing this meeting, and I very much welcome the initiative to include the voice of the education and training sector at the Porto Social Summit in May. I welcome it because this sector has a valuable contribution to make to the European social model and the implementation of the European pillar of social rights. For this to materialize, it is essential that we maintain the level of ambition set out at the Gothenburg Social Summit in 2017. The same level of ambition is also reflected in our communications on the European education area, the new digital education action plan and the skills agenda. And our discussions today were extremely useful. I encourage ministers to be daring in advancing the European education area. We are facing a one-off opportunity to take a giant step towards fulfilling our ambitions. In line with the first principle of the European pillar of social rights, one of our key priorities is to promote high quality, inclusive, forward-looking education and training systems. Systems that harness technology and support all learners, irrespective of gender, age or background. And today I presented some of the European initiatives that will allow us to deliver on these goals. First, the Pathways to School Success Initiative. This initiative will help pupils reach a certain level of proficiency in basic skills and complete upper secondary education especially disadvantaged groups at risk of underachievement and early school leaving. In the coming months, the Commission will consult the education sector on this initiative and work with member states to develop policy guidance. This preparatory work will feed into a proposal for a Council recommendation. Second, to support social cohesion, the higher education sector in Europe needs to be transformed. We need to equip people with the right mix of skills and competencies in a lifelong learning perspective so they can fully participate in society, successfully manage transition to the labour market and progress in their careers. We'll launch a public consultation to help create a transformation agenda for higher education by the end of the year. Third, it is important to promote access to higher education for all types of learners. We need to streamline lifelong learning by providing more flexible and modular learning opportunities. This is why Commissioner Schmidt and I, we are working this year in order to develop a European approach for micro-credentials. And we want to table a proposal for a council recommendation by the end of 2021. Next, learning from the COVID-19 crisis means also paying special attention to digital education. I look forward to discussing this at the school education seminar the presidency is organizing in April and at the high-level conference in May. And as a follow-up to the new digital education action plan, we are launching a dialogue on how to move to successful digital education. 
I will also propose a Council recommendation on distance and online learning already in the first half of this year. It is not about shifting teaching online, it is about transforming the learning experience so it harnesses the potential of technology while making sure that all learners are included and engaged. We must no leave, not leave anyone behind. And finally, I would like to emphasize that education and training, as well as investment in inclusive green and digital transitions, hold the key to Europe's future resilience and prosperity. Next Generation EU and the new European budget are going to inject important resources into the European economy. This will help member states recover from the COVID-19 crisis and build stronger economic and societal systems. I invited member states today to give high priority to investment in education and training in their national recovery and resilience plans and to make the best use of the funding available through the recovery and resilience facility. I also encourage them to support the Commission's approach to future cooperation in education and training in the Council resolution to be adopted at our Education Council in February. I will finish by once again thanking the Portuguese Presidency. I look forward to working with them on all the challenges we are facing in the education and training sector. Thank you. And now we give the floor to Commissioner Nicola Schmidt, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tiago, Manuel, and uh, Maria. I think this, uh, this uh, informal meeting of education ministers uh, was very productive and very helpful, also for the preparation of the social summit in Porto. Uh, we uh, organized this social summit precisely because we are in a real crisis, not just a crisis because of the pandemic, but also a crisis because a lot of things in our economies, in our production systems uh, are changing. And here we all agree that uh, investing in skills, investing in education, investing in knowledge, uh, as Manuel uh, insisted on, is ex absolutely key. Uh, we, we see that uh, on labor markets, and this is the important linkage between investment in education and skills and the good functioning of labor markets, uh, are changing. Uh, there are new needs for skills, new needs, especially also for digital skills. Pushing for a green economy means also that uh, we have to develop uh, green skills. When I look at uh, the situation on the labor market, especially in, uh, in relation to digital skills, we notice that only 44% or at least 44% of the EU uh, working uh, population lack basic digital skills. And at the other end, we uh, know that now about 90% of all jobs have a request for at least basic digital skills. When we ask companies what their major uh, concern is about uh, uh, finding the right uh, uh, stuff, well, they tell us that uh, uh, it is extremely difficult to recruit specialists or people just having the right digital skills. This is an enormous challenge. Uh, so we have to prepare our young for this, but especially we have to invest a lot in skilling and reskilling those who are in our working force. This is uh, one of the enormous uh, challenges. Now. Uh, we are at the moment uh, where uh, the European Union has a lot mobilized, a lot of resources. Maria has just mentioned it. Uh, we have uh, the ESF Plus, which uh, invests a lot in people, in skilling, in reskilling. But we also have now the instrument of uh, Next Generation EU, uh, the resources of the recovery and resilience facility, which are also at the uh, disposal of member states, uh, at the disposal of the national plans for investing uh, in people, for investing in education, for modernizing uh, the education systems and uh, adapting them to the new, uh, to the new requests. Now, um, I agree fully that uh, employability 
is key, as uh, Manuel insisted on. Employability, and here there is urgency. We cannot afford to have long-time structural unemployment in our societies for the millions of people who have already lost their job and those who are at risk. So we have to develop the right responses. We have to organize the right transitions. And here again, uh, skilling is key and investing in education, in lifelong learning is absolutely necessary. Now, the uh, European Commission has put into place a certain number of instruments already. Together with Maria, we developed the skills agenda, which uh, precisely is a flagship uh, action and which should be also uh, one of the uh, major objectives uh, in, in the action plan for implementing the social pillar, opening also opening the right to be reskilled and upskilled for every worker, for every citizen. This is uh, uh, a knowledge society. And uh, somebody uh, this morning recalled the Lisbon sum summit in 2000. That was about developing knowledge, a knowledge society. Well, this uh, remains absolutely true today, and we have the opportunity to do so and to open knowledge to everybody. I think this is the big social challenge. And I know that uh, the, the Portuguese presidency insists a lot on this social dimension in uh, all our policies, and precisely uh, in the policy to get out of the uh, crisis, the present crisis, but also to organize the transitions in a way that leaves nobody behind, that uh, leaves nobody outside uh, our economy and outside the labor market. So this is uh, a good preparation for the Porto Summit. Uh, I'm really very happy um, uh, about the contributions, about the inputs which have been done, and we try to take a lot of these inputs on, on board for the action plan. And uh, now we uh, will certainly meet in uh, Porto to continue this uh, important work. Thank you very much. Now we have uh, time for a very limited number of questions that the journalists can pose. Please state your name and the media organization you're representing. We'll start with a question from the room. RTP, please. Yes, good afternoon. Ana Luisa Rodrigues from RTP, Portuguese television um, broadcaster. One of the proposals is the digital transition. One of the proposals within the European um, Commission is the digital transition. It's very relevant given the situation of lockdown of schools and closure of schools throughout uh, Europe. How was this issue tackled during this informal video conference meeting? What uh, conclusions were drawn? What measures were adopted to tackle the issue of school closures and lockdown and dealing with the difficulties that are caused by this? And in Portugal, the decision to close schools, was this something that was affected by the delay in actually implementing the digital school program in Portugal and actually providing computers to um, school children in Portugal. Thank you. OK, well, to reply to your uh, questions, obviously this is an international meeting. We're talking about European issues. It wouldn't be very court courteous to talk about national issues. Yesterday I was in a conference, a press conference, where a journalist from RTP asked exactly the same question and I answered it yesterday. But I just wanted to say that at this video conference what we were focusing on is how important it is to work together to ensure that the digital dimension is part of our society, starting with education. And Portugal has... Um, IT as a compulsory subject in our schools now. That wasn't the case for a number of years, and now it is again. And other programs have been um, stepped up, not uh, slowed down by the pandemic. So we were able to give training to teachers. We were able to ensure the digitalization of our 
teaching material as well. We've got uh, free manuals and free reuse uh, with digital licenses. It's something that is seen as an, an example internationally. And we were able to buy a significant number of uh, computers, and we got them to pupils who the, the pupils who most needed uh, them. So this was something that is very a very positive example. We need digitalization, of course, to take place. We need to ensure that education, using computers, using digitalization as an instrument, as a, as a mean, but not. Um, an end in itself, it's a means to an end. Distance learning is something that cannot substitute entirely physical learning in the classroom. We're all aware of that. And a lot of countries talked about the progress that they had made in terms of the public policy decisions that they've taken to try to ensure that, like we've done, that uh, we try to indeed close schools when we need to do that and ensure that that is recompensed. And this is something that we can make up for this time still before the end of the school year because physical teaching in the classroom, nothing can replace that really. I said to the directors yesterday... They said that they were much better prepared than they were in the past. They were able to work on this and set up a distance learning education system and be properly supported by the Ministry of Education and by the municipalities in Portugal. We're much better prepared. We're much more flexible, able to act much more quickly in this area. The teachers have a different level of training and skills because, of course, uh, additional uh, training of teachers... I mean, when teachers were... Um, were at, uh, at university, they didn't necessarily learn all of these things. Obviously, there is lifelong learning, but we were able to upskill teachers very quickly. And the central issue here is that if you need to close schools, and now it's still possible during the school year because it's still the start of the second term, it wasn't the case last year because we can actually recompense this time, we can make up this time with physical presence in the classroom. Obviously, we need to find different solutions. This was something that the ministers of education across the European Union said the same thing because a number of them have, of course, faced similar situations and, sim and taken similar decisions to the ones that were taken in Portugal. We now have a question from Brussels. Susana Freix, also in Portuguese it will be, but it's from Brussels so remotely. Yes, Susana Fresh from Espresso Seek. I do have a question for the Minister of Education. Did you have an exchange of views about what's being done to coordinate measures uh, to respond to the COVID crisis in schools across Europe? Across Europe? Could perhaps... Uh, could you perhaps build on experiences elsewhere, the Belgian experience or a blended experience or the situation where you have an alternation between pupils, some in the classroom one week, others in the classroom the next week? Is that something that Portugal could do in about in, in a fortnight's time? And then another national question. There are some primary schools that are open or are um, giving distance classes and are open for exams. Is this um, appropriate, given that there is freedom of education? Can you leave these primary schools and allow these primary schools and schools to work and also support to parents? Parents... Uh, would that cover parents of 12 years of 12 years of age or aren't they covered this coordination coordination in terms of responses uh, regarding schools uh, online uh, classes and some member states uh, shooting down the, the schools as well thank you Okay, well, to react to your question, I'm not going to go into domestic issues. You could uh, put that to the Ministry of em to the Minister of Employment. Social subsidies are given 
for those who have children at home who are up to 12 years, so including 12 years of age. Now, the question that you asked about the discussions that we had in the video conference, I just wanted to make it absolutely clear that what we talked about here was the important contribution that education can make to the European pillar of social rights. Obviously, as part of the European social model, we're all aware of how important the European pillar of social rights is because it ensures that um, education is guaranteed to citizens, to all citizens. They all have access to education, access to social inclusion and employment, and obviously schools are very important in this. On distance learning, clear rules are in place. We have to ensure that all pupils, all pupils can have the time that they haven't been at school compensated during time, during holidays perhaps. That's what we want. All children in compulsory schooling should have the right, independently of their school system, they should have the right to the classes that can still be covered physically because distance learning is not a substitute for physical learning in the classroom. So that was why this decision was taken. The word to Commissioner uh, Gabriel, please. Do you hear me now? Yes, it's perfect. Well, I would like to react very, very briefly because already the, the Minister answered for the most important aspect of the question, but I think that the main message is that we need really to, 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 to stay in a permanent contact in order to exchange information because, above all, the health and the safety of our children, our teachers, our staff from the education system is a priority. That means that uh, never the online learning will replace the people-to-people, -people, the emotional contact, but thanks to new technologies now, we have some instruments at our disposal and we can, we can react. That's why for us what is important is that together with members, member states, we continue to work on what's about the lessons learned during the crisis. It's very clear we need to invest in order to provide better equipment, in order to provide better connectivity. And that's why in the framework of our Digital Education Action Plan, there is concrete proposals. This year, the Commission will propose a Council recommendation on online and distance learning. In the Digital Education Action Plan, we have new initiative, Connectivity for School. And in the framework of the Erasmus Plus program, it's already sure that we'll provide blended mobility and blended learning in order really to use these opportunities. The same, there is an important issue linked to the trainings uh, offered to our teachers. That was one of the challenges during this crisis. And that's why, remember, in our proposal for the European education area, there is now the, the wish to have 25 European teachers' academies at European level. And I'm, I, I'm sure that here, together with member states, we'll manage to find the right form, the right solution. Third, of course, higher education. I would like here to mention already the good example of our European University alliances. Portugal is participating actively. We have 41 alliances, 280 universities. I must say that 80% of our European University alliances already said that if this initiative was here one year before, they will be better prepared for crisis like the, the, the actual one. And 60% of them already started to share materials, to work on interoperability. So the most important for me is really to continue to work on access, that means equipment, connectivities for vulnerable groups, for remote areas, to work on content, certified high quality content and the access to this content, and of course, better coordination between member states. And this year, that will be uh, a concrete proposal to establish a digital education hub and we'll invite, and today I invited member states to work together in order to have this advisory network in every one of our member states in order to continue to promote the cooperation, the coordination in this strategic field, which is the education and training. Thank you. I don't know if Commissioner Schmidt would like to answer as well. No, 
very, very briefly. I, I think there is an important issue about uh, remote learning, and especially due to the pandemic, because there is a risk that uh, uh, there the uh, inequalities between uh, uh, children is uh, is increasing, and that's also about the implementation of the uh, pillar of social rights, because uh, there is a principle on equal opportunities, and therefore it's uh, absolutely key to invest a lot in equipment, to invest a lot also at the level of the kids in digital skilling uh, through the schools, uh, to uh, allow all the kids to have the right connections, because very often uh, poorer families, they do not have internet connection, they do not have the equipment. So that's an important challenge to equip everybody, because we are in a digital society. And uh, we should not leave parts of our, uh, our, of our citizens, and especially kids outside of this uh, digital society. So I think uh, uh, to invest in uh, digital equipment, to invest not only in skills, but also the equipment, to invest also in uh, uh, the fact that uh, 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 people and, and, and households have to be connected is, for me, extremely important. Thank you. Another question from the room, please. Boa tarde, Manuela Pires, sou jornalista da Renascença. I had two questions, one for each minister. First of all, for the Minister of Science. You talked about Erasmus Plus, 2021 to 2027. The budget has been doubled, but what uh, other novelties are there in Erasmus Plus? What does it offer in terms of equal access? And then, Minister of Education, we've uh, talked a lot about remote learning. Uh, there are hundreds and thousands of, of pupils, some more better equipped than others, um, who are uh, doing remote learning. Um, there is going to be a great deal of inequality. Um, did you discuss this, and what can the European Union do to try and uh, offset, to iron out these inequalities, and who is going to be left behind over the next uh, few months or years. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, Erasmus, the next Erasmus, uh, um, is basically a continuation of what we've seen up until now. It is a process of uh, evolution of, de of uh, developments. You've seen uh, what's happened under previous presidencies. We have uh, the, the trio of presidencies, uh, the Commission, the Parliament. Um, from our discussions, it's clear that Erasmus uh, will follow on from the previous programme, but there will be two new elements. First of all, access to vocational and professional training. And this is something that was addressed by uh, quite a few member states. And this is something that we're seeing more and more in Portugal as well. Uh, and we also have this uh, 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 network of alliances. We heard from the Commissioner earlier about this. At the moment, we have uh, uh, these different Europa European University alliances. Um, uh, Portugal is very active. We are involved in uh, 14 such networks, either through our universities or our polytechnical uh, colleges. And these networks uh, will be a way of uh, addressing uh, the question of uh, social uh, access, social equality, and also they're very important when it comes to um, research and uh, the exchange of equipment. So it's an ongoing process. Um, the role of Erasmus has evolved. If you look back 10 years or 20 years, uh, we were basically talking about Erasmus and mobility, but mobility, uh, but Erasmus has become uh, much more than that. Uh, it uh, will make sure that our higher education uh, institutions are based on proper uh, real consortiums, and this will lead to uh, proper joint uh, recruitment of researchers uh, uh, and scientists on the basis of these joint programs. So these are the two new elements. Uh, 
the creation of these networks of consortiums and uh, secondly opening up Erasmus to other forms of formal and informal education in particular vocational and professional training. As you know, um, we have been working on the Digital Action Plan. We've uh, tried to address this challenge. We have this dual transition, the digital transition and the green transition. And uh, in that context, we have to find answers. We know that the objectives are very ambitious. We know how difficult it's going to be, but we have to look at the uh, most uh, vulnerable, those who will be affected most by being um, away from the school environment. Um, remote uh, learning does not fully replace uh, in-person education. There are all sorts of issues such as mental health, um, physical activity, uh, social well-being, and those uh, matters can't be uh, uh, addressed by remote learning, remote education. And this is uh, very important when it comes to uh, making political uh, choices. Obviously, we have to prepare remote for remote learning, but we should continue to give priority to in-person education, face-to-face -face education. We don't want to uh, uh, overvalue uh, the importance of rem remote uh, learning. We are in, uh, in the middle of a pandemic, and obviously we have to take certain steps, and we're we also have to find ways of creating um, active citizenship in our societies. We have to be as well prepared as we can be. We do have to train people in digital uh, uh, matters, but uh, we need to also ensure that we guarantee in-person education because remote learning cannot replace in-person uh, teaching. One does not replace the other. We have uh, uh, a particular uh, program on the digital transition in Portugal, and this is very much in line with the Commission's uh, objectives. Uh, in the context of the pandemic, uh, uh, it was very interesting to hear what ministers had to say uh, about the problems in training teachers as well, when that's remote learning as well, how, how to train them in uh, ensuring access to the most vulnerable pupils. I'm not talking about bigger computers, more powerful computers. It's very difficult for teachers. Uh, for example, if you're dealing with first-year uh, students, it doesn't really matter what type of equipment you have. Uh, um, you might have... Um, pupils who don't know how to read very well, who can't write very well. Uh, so uh, but pupils, students who are used to using computers for, 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 for leisure activities rather than as a tool for education. Our aim in making all these sacrifices, in making all these efforts, is to... Uh, stem the spread of the pandemic. And our ultimate objective is to get ch children back into school because uh, the fallout of uh, remote education might not be seen straight away um, in the short term, but it's something that we're going to see later on in the medium term and in the long term. So uh, this uh, uh, applies across the board. It doesn't really matter. You know, uh, some education um, systems are more complex than others. Um, but everybody is having uh, difficulty in adapting. Sometimes it's difficult to get uh, access to uh, the right form of uh, computer infrastructure. Um, we do want to return to uh, uh, in-person education as quickly as possible. Um, uh, ongoing remote learning will have a long-term effect. If you would like to add something, the floor is yours. 
Yes, I will very briefly react on the first question, what's about the new elements in, in, in Erasmus Plus program. Minister Manuel Hector already pointed out how important it is vocational education and training, and uh, I would like to remind that during the negotiations on the budget, that was decided that four, 400 million euro will be dedicated to these 50 centers of excellence that we would like to establish in, in Europe and in all our member states. The second, of course, that's the European University Alliances, and it's very closely linked to the transformation agenda for higher education that we would like to propose this year. But if I, I have to resume, our ambition is very clear. Since the creation of Erasmus+, Plus, 10 million Europeans benefited from this huge experience. And now, with this almost double budget, we would like to have 10 million more for the next seven years. That means that we would like to see an Erasmus Plus more inclusive, more green and more digital. Inclusive, that means not only vocational education and training, but for me it's a good signal that we'll extend Erasmus Plus to secondary schools, they will have this opportunity now. We would like to propose to, to our vocational education training the possibility to, to use the digital opportunity traineeships, you know, the traineeships that are paid by the European Commission. When we talk about uh, making Erasmus more green, two new elements, we would like to create a green Erasmus in order to allow our young people and not so much young to participate in this common task, which is uh, tackling climate change. Another important element, I announced it during our education summit in, in December, we would like to create the European Coalition for Education for Climate, and I very much count on the, the positive contribution of the education community for this challenge. Another important novelty is that we'll put an accent to the small-scale partnerships in order to allow to more people, small organizations, to participate. That means that we have to facilitate the administration procedures, we have to simplify some of the main, the main phases. I already mentioned the teachers' academies, uh, the digital education hub. One last point. We would like and we'll launch this year a feasibility study about the creation of a European platform for access to certified high quality online materials for everyone for free. I think that it's really time that we have our own European space and that's why the contributions of every sub member states of Portugal and all the others are uh, so important for us. So you can, you can see with the new program for many months we focused our attention on the budget. Now it's done. We almost doubled it. The question is will be to start to deliver as soon as possible and we have the good framework for that. The European education area, the European research area and the digital education action plan. Commissioner Schmidt, if you would like to also add something, please. It's fine. Thank you, Commissioner. We have only time for one more question, and this will come from Brussels. Um, Mathieu Billon, Agence Europe, please. Yes, good afternoon. Um, Mathieu Billon, Agence Europe in Brussels. I, Commissioner Schmidt uh, mentioned the need to invest in uh, digital skills using the EU. Um, next generation uh, uh, recovery plan. So to the, what does the, the Portuguese uh, recovery plan foresee in this respect? And uh, to the commissioners, when you see the, the draft uh, recovery plans uh, that the, some member states uh, have uh, submitted to, to the commission, uh, what's your assessment? Do you think they, they include enough uh, uh, investments uh, in, in education, in innovation, in, uh, in skills. Thank you very much. The Portuguese recovery plan has set aside 500 million euros for the digitalization program for the education system. It's a very ambitious program, and its main aim is to give schools the necessary new infrastructure, uh, new equipment, but also uh, better 
uh, network uh, speed. And uh, it also focuses on digitalization of resources and uh, um, training of teachers. Now, uh, this uh, was welcomed, I think, by the uh, Commission. Um, this is all very recent, of course. Um, we're in the process of uh, discussing this uh, with the Commission. Uh, so it's an ongoing dialogue uh, uh, with a view to uh, uh, implementing this aspect of the uh, recovery plan, the Portuguese Recovery and Resilience Plan. Thank you very much for the, the question. Um, I would like to point out, um, and then Commissioner Maria Gabriel could also add, the importance of the synergies among different European programs. Certainly, we all throughout Europe are focusing very much on the recovery plans associated with the next generation Europe. But it's also important to make sure that that package of money is very well articulated with other programs, particularly Horizon Europe and the Digital Europe program. And certainly throughout this articulation, also with European structural and investment funds, will be certainly um, possible to build always a better Europe in the years to come. About Portugal, and in complement with um, the um, program that uh, uh, Minister Tiago Brandon Rodrigues has already mentioned, we are also very much interested in dimensions associated with the digital transitions and the digital skills for companies, certainly associated with um, um, higher education institutions, but also to other particular programs, one associated with enlarging enlarging the number of students in higher education and graduated from higher education, particularly in areas of science, technology, engineering, the arts and mathematics, what we call STEAM, but also, but also more and more adult training across every um, sectors of um, our economic activity. And adult training, particularly in many Southern European countries, among others, is a great challenge. Um, and the opportunities which we have are enormous, particularly in the areas of reskilling, but also upskilling. And those two topics were particularly discussed throughout um, the meeting by several um, member states. Last but not least, I should note that the Portuguese recovery plan also includes another dimension which will be critical for the enlargement of the European education area, if we can call it like that, which is um, housing for students and accessible housing for everyone, but also housing for a student, which will be critical in many, many countries if we want to enlarge the number of students engaged in agri-education, if we want to engage and to enlarge the Erasmus program in Europe, we need to make sure that we have the necessary infrastructures to house students throughout Europe, also associated with um, the mobility uh, patterns in Europe. And that is the, definitely a dimension which we are also considering in the Portuguese um, recovery plan. Thank you. Madam Commissioner, please. My answer will be very, very brief. I didn't see any national strategy. And I, I, I know that our member states have time for that, but that's why it's so important to use these weeks and months in order to, to insist again that investments in education, training, research, innovation are strategic investment. My plea to all our member states is very simple. Now we have new instruments at our disposal from Erasmus Plus and Horizon Europe program with, with this important budget 
to the structural funds, to the European Social Fund and Next Generation EU and Resilience and Recovery Facility. The plea is let's use these new instruments in order to build impact-oriented new partnerships, in order to make operational the possible synergies, because we have now a lot of possibilities and that's why it's so important that the next uh, months we continue to, to, to raise this issue at the top of the agenda and again to coordinate our, our efforts in order to achieve better results. Commissioner Schmidt, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I have not uh, too much to add uh, to what uh, Commissioner uh, just said, but I think that uh, first we, we do not know exactly all the elements of the national plans. It's also the beginning of the process. Second, I think the Portuguese, what we know about the Portuguese plans, they go absolutely in the right direction. I think this is a good example how uh, uh, this national plan should, uh, should be uh, designed, especially in relation to investment in, in skilling, in digital, uh, in digital skilling. Uh, the, another important point is, indeed, we, we, uh, the national plans should devote 20% uh, uh, to uh, digital uh, reform or digital uh, restructuring and digital investment. And uh, when we are talking about digital investment, well, it's, it's very important to invest in people because it's not just about uh, machines or, or robots and, uh, uh, and intelli uh, artificial intelligence. It's first about people who, who are able to use all these instruments. And our big problem is there. So I think uh, we will have a lot of, uh, hopefully, uh, investments in the direction of reskilling, upskilling. And here, the Pact for Skills is also uh, an important framework because uh, we, uh, we have to reform, we have to restructure a lot of industrial and also service industries. And uh, these reforms, this restructuring uh, absolutely involves uh, digitalization. And uh, in order to be successful on this digitalization process, again, we have to invest in our workforce. We have to give people the opportunity uh, to take uh, pace with these uh, technological changes. So I think uh, uh, we will see uh, the national plans uh, integrate this uh, dimension. Thank you. So thank you all very much. Thank you, ministers. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, this is all the time that we have for our press conference today. Thank you.